Why so sad? By John Rattray and John Horner. What were we scared of? A long time ago, I was processing some serious loss. Somehow or another, as part of that processing, John and I made a comic. I knew very little about mental health. It was still a murky subject back then. Mainly because we were scared to shine a light on it. I used to hear a term like the subconscious, and it evoked thoughts of a dark and misty cave full of scary things we could not see. The ego and its boss, the superego, and the terrifying monstrous id. Amorphous demons, ghosts, and dragons laid wait in the subconscious. At any moment, they might leap out like some balrog of lore and devour our mental faculties. Turns out, nope, it's just your pesky old brainstem, diencephalon, and limbic system. They're the automatic response systems of your brain, where snap judgments are made. The stuff that helped us survive up until now. Our reflexes live there and help us pull our hand away from a flame without having to think about it, for example. But they can get messed up. What I didn't know was how much of an effect adverse or traumatic experiences have on the mechanics of those automatic response systems. And the annoying thing is, I lived my whole life from the age of 13 onwards, suffering and not having any clear idea why. The 1980s, a long roller coaster ride. My sister Katrina and I live with our mum and dad in a house in Aberdeen, Scotland. Our dad is a local small business owner. He's funny and clever, but also severely addicted to the thing called the booze. That means our house is little unpredictable. Each evening, we don't know what's coming in the door. But more often than not, it's like something sent by the Wicked Witch of the West. It isn't always a crazy train, but it's off the rails a lot. After a long roller coaster ride when I'm 13, Dad finally gives me the album I'd been asking for. When I get out of here, I'll teach you to fish. A few weeks later, he's back in hospital. This time, he leads me to the bathroom by the ICU and shows me the clotted blood passing through him. This time, he tells me, do as I say, not as I do. He's descended into alcoholism past the point of no return. Not long after, he's gone. The 90s and 2000s, waves within. After Dad died, I dove deep into skating. As I grew through teen years, I experienced what I now know to be dissociative states and periods of sustained depression. I would tell myself that I just needed to give it time to pass and pretend that things felt okay. Skating helped. Having that focus, that crew, us, together versus the world. Sometimes I think the pain of learning to skate helped distract from the weirdness. Sometimes it was just the act of skating itself that helped calm the storm. Through all this, Katrina had followed her own path, and life had jostled her hard. I feel lucky I found skateboarding and everything that goes with it. Katrina didn't make it through. In 2011, she died by suicide. 2017 to 22. Why so sad? By the year 2017, shit was hitting the fan again. Finally, I went to see the doctor and explained what I was experiencing in my brain as best I could. Once again, the thought that I am so damaged and lost that I need to end my life was cycling through my mind. You're depressed. Answer these questions, please. Well, you had a rough childhood. That can really mess things up. What things? The zombie's favourite food, John. Our brains. You see, every moment, our brains process info coming in through our five senses. This process occurs in stages and in a specific order, from the bottom up. The first stage is automatic rapid response, pure sensory. We always feel first before we even think a coherent thought. Our auto-response system decides if we are safe or in danger. It does this based on associations it imprinted when we were growing up, when our brains were first developing, and learning what sort of world we can expect to encounter. If your auto system sense safety, your brain remains calm, then up in your top brain, the thinking part, you have the opportunity to reflect on the situation and make a reasoned decision on how to respond. One key problem is, when your auto brain senses threat, it deploys resources away from the top thinking part. At that point, we behave purely on what our auto brain is telling us. This can lead to some, let's just call it, poor decision making. 
The point is, when you've had a bunch of crappy crap happen to you as a kid, your brain's auto system gets all out of whack. You can end up with a hair trigger stress response, and that can really do you a disservice. It'll be dropping you into fight flight mode in all sorts of scenarios where that's really counterproductive. When this goes on unchecked, it can make us feel all types of crazy, and we can end up very desperate. Great Scott! You mean all those things? The horror, the embarrassment, the fear and anger, and the pain. The chronic unpredictable chaos made it so my auto brain was structured to respond as if the whole world might always be like that. Long story short, yes. So does this mean I'm done for? Doomed? Finito? End of story? Long story short, no. The brain can change. It's malleable. The key is providing patterns of predictable, moderate, controllable activations of these systems to conquer all that previous chaos. How? You said earlier that the act of skating itself would help calm the storm. The reason for that is that when we're stressed, patterned repetitive motion is inherently calming. One of the first associations your brain makes is when you're still in the womb. In there, you're safe and warm. You hear this, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. Physical activity of all sorts can help us intervene on ourselves when we notice our stress response starting to over-rev. Second, your connectedness to culture and community is more predictive of your well-being than your history of adversity. You mean my skate crew saved me just by being there? Pretty much. And hopefully, now that we understand it all better, we can be more intentional and less judgmental in how we look out for ourselves and each other. Dropping science like a shot drops hammers. Stevie, how are you? Ah, perfect timing. Dr. Perry, I presume? I was just about to explain the neurosequential model. Important stuff. If we experience extreme prolonged trauma growing up, there's more chance we'll have an overly sensitized stress response as adults. This can cause all sorts of problems. But if we know what we're working with, we can learn to notice it and manage it. Trees look like brains, don't they? Let's go with that. First, we sense our situation through our senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste, info from the world around you and from your body. This all immediately hits the brain stem, our body's security guard holding it down at the front door, rapid assessment, sketchy or mellow. The brain stem sends its assessment signal up to our body's switchboard operator, the diencephalon. This department works with the limbic system above to manage emotions and memories. The limbic system is where emotions and behaviors emerge. Feeling emotionally connected to trusted peers is what regulates us here. It also regulates survival responses, fight, flight, etc. Physiological systems throughout the body are activated based on that sense of safety or threat. If we feel safe, we remain calm, and the process continues up to the neocortex, the big human thinking part of the brain, the executive function. Here is where we can assess if feelings are worth acting on or if they are spurious, our feelings don't always tell the truth. If our stress response is revving, we operate based on low and mid-brain instincts and literally lose access to executive function. If we had a messed up childhood or sustained extreme trauma, our instincts, auto responses, can become problematic. Noticing this process allows us agency to manage it in the short term and heal in the longer term. All of these systems stack to form what Dr. Bruce Perry refers to as the tree of regulation. A central concept in all of this is called state-dependent functioning. Basically, your ability to clearly think is connected to your emotional state. What the tree illustrates is that here, when we are calm, our brain works all the way to the top. The cortex is energized, it's operational, and we can engage in what we call top-down regulation, cognitive therapy. We can think our way through challenges. As we become anxious, our brain's resources move down into the lower departments as we tend towards a more of a basic survival mode. We become less able to think the further into survival mode we go. Consider it. You can feel this happening when something begins to stress you. Even the basics, like getting hungry, trigger this response. We evolved this way for a reason. No time to think when you're being attacked by a bear. Now, when we're highly dysregulated, the brain's energy is vastly weighted to the full throttle fight-flight survival systems. Given the balance of brain energy here, we have a really hard time thinking clearly in this state, and our path back to calm is purely physical. This is where sports and other rhythmic activities are vital for self-care. But you said my skate crew saved me. What does all that science have to do with shredding the gnar? Well... That bottom-up process can get cut short if our brain isn't fully healthy. 
But if our stress response systems have been altered by all the old chaos, we can change them back by using moderate pattern predictable doses of challenge. Good news, that's what skateboarding is. So start with your brainstem, the processor, the whoosh when you drop in, the grip tape under your shoes when you adjust your feet, the feel of the coping, it all pours in through this one funnel. All this good stuff is fundamental to the healthy operation of the brain. It helps soothe and regulate your mind. That's true. When I'm skating, a lot of the everyday stuff seems to just drop away. Next up is the diencephalon. This is where skating can really shine. Patterned repetitive movements are generally a great way for the human brain to self-regulate. Think about learning to ollie and how many times you tried the same movements over and over again until you got the rhythm down. Or carving a hill, pumping a ramp. Skateboarding is full of repetition and patterns that help you get to a protected state. Kind of like hypnosis? Yes. When folks are nicely regulated as a result of that healthy stimuli and those patterned movements, we begin to quiet an overactive stress response. This helps further up the tree. Up another level, our emotional response manifests through the third gate, our limbic system, the puppet master pulling the strings, the Wizard of Oz hiding behind the curtain. The limbic system mediates emotions, attachment, and relationships. To be calm here, we need to feel emotional connections with trusted peers. This is where the skate scene really shines. Your pals cheer you on when you land a trick and scrape you off the floor when you slam. You learn from each other, help each other climb over fences, and build death-defying ramps as a crew. You can rock up at a spot anywhere in the world, and no matter the language barriers, you can talk fluently to any skater anywhere through the lexicon of Shred. Like when I moved to America, and no one could understand my accent. Combine the positive social setting of the skate scene with a highly sensory and regulating activity like skating, and skaters are in a pretty decent place to learn new skills. This leads us neatly up to the very top level, the neocortex. The process of abstract reasoning and learning new skills happens in the neocortex. Skating's full of chances to learn something new, both on and off the board. You can even get into complex skill development when you start linking different tricks together. All of this creates opportunities for moderate, predictable challenges, which we know heal overactive stress response systems and build resilience over time. Whoa, so skating has been helping me out without me even knowing it? Pretty much, yeah. There's a reason why you've been drawn to your board when things have got tough. But now we understand the process a bit better, we can take action to right the direction our brain takes. Remember the slam you took back on the cover of this comic? A lot of your reaction was due to an overly reactive stress response thanks to past trauma. It set off an unhelpful chain reaction in your brain, and that's why you got in such a state. Let's go back with our new toolkit and try it again. Brainstem, got a hot one coming your way. Diencephalon, Roger, let's send it on up. Limbic system, this one for us? Nah, he's chill. Send it up. Neocortex, thoughts everybody? Good.